Okay, so welcome everyone to the theoretical and computational biophysics seminars. Um, it's my great pleasure to uh, introduce uh, Dr. Carissa Sanbalmatsu from Los Alamos National Lab. So she is a structural biologist, a computational structural biologist at the Institute uh, at, the, at the National Lab. And uh, um, uh, since 2001, she has been running the, her group there. By way of introduction, uh, Carissa received her training in physics from Columbia University initially, and then she received a PhD in uh, astrophysics, actually, uh, from Colorado a few years later. And somehow she got interested in biomolecular simulations, all the way from astrophysics to <laughs> biomolecules. So. Um, she is very well known for her work in the nucleic acid domains, you know, really large structures of nucleic acids, including chromatin, ribosome. I remember her talk 15 years ago here in Beckman Institute on ribosome simulation, one of the first ribosome simulations actually. But she also has work on the, uh, more fundamental problems like protein folding force fields and how they control the behavior of my biomolecules. So we, uh, we have, uh, I would say, we share the interest in looking at systems that are cellular scale, like the chromatin, for example, structure, and how to study the behavior of these macromolecules um, more closely to, to their cellular kind of representations. Uh, and you, I'm sure you can see this from, from her talk. Um, She's also a fellow of the American Physical Society in 2012 and uh, a vocal advocate of LBG, LGBT scientists. Uh, for those of you who are on Twitter, you, 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 you have noticed that. And I just discovered from your resume, by the way, that she has a very interesting TED talk that I encourage everyone to listen to about the biology of, ge of gender from DNA to the brain which has um, almost two and a half million uh, viewers or probably more actually right now. So I encourage everybody to also visit uh, that talk uh, later after the seminar, <laughs> not during the seminar. So th Carissa, thank you very much for accepting our invitation and joining us this afternoon. And we all look forward to hear more about how to simulate nucleic acids and nucleic acid protein complexes, please. Hey. Well, thank you so much for that uh, great introduction. It's great to be virt at least virtually back at um, at uh, Illinois. And so um, I'll start my uh, PowerPoint. OK, can everyone see the slide? OK. Yes. OK, so today I'm going to uh, it's kind of a two part talk. One part is about ribose switches, and one part is about um, ribosomes. And in our lab, we do a lot on nucleic acids. And our overall strategy is kind of to take new technology and apply it to the ribose switches and get it home there on those small systems, and then eventually port it to the ribosome system and also a chromatin. And so in the ribose switch systems, um, uh, we, I have my own wet lab there since uh, 2008 or so, and so we do a lot of biochemistry on trying to figure out how these small RNAs work. The ribose switches are interesting nowadays in the sense that these are, um, you know, in the untranslated region of the messenger RNA, and there's a lot of interest now in terms of vaccine development for uh, being able to predict RNA structure, mRNA structure, mRNP structure, and understanding how these uh, structures evolve in, in the cell. They, they tend to be a lot more dynamic than proteins. And we'll see that ribose switches uh, basically have two completely different, the same sequence as two completely different secondary structures and tertiary structures. And then in terms of ribosomes, um, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about some of the older stuff in explicit solvent. And lately we're mostly doing uh, structure-based um, native contact models on ribosomes and what we're learning about tRNA moving through the ribosome. Okay, so first I'll tell you about ribose switches. So uh, as I mentioned here, we have one sequence that can have two entirely different secondary structures. And so if you're not an RNA person, these are the typical uh, 2D diagrams for RNA. 
and they basically represent the arrangement of helices. So something like the ribosome, for example, has uh, uh, even the small subunit has 44 helices. And essentially you have lots of helices connected by uh, these junction connecting regions and the way they collapse and fold on each other that gives you the 3D structure. Um, and so this is just showing the 2D diagram that gives you kind of the map of how the RNA is laid out. So in this, uh, the main system we've been working on is the SAM1 ribose switch, which binds the metabolite acidenosomethionine. And the aptamer, and uh, uh, some other jargon is that aptamer means the piece of the RNA that binds the ligand. And, uh, and also in terms of the terminology, ribose switch technically is something that binds a small molecule. And, and that small molecule uh, has the effect of changing the, the structure and controlling gene expression. And so in this case, we have the aptamer, which is four helices. And then uh, uh, on, apart from that is this uh, terminator helix, which acts to terminate transcription and shut the gene off. On the other hand, if the uh, metabolite is not present, it forms this other secondary structure uh, in, in that case, the terminator is not formed and then gene expression is allowed to go. And this is the basic principle of how a transcriptional arrival switch works. And nowadays the big pharma companies are racing to get it, to be able to predict RNA structure. They're really building out their RNA teams and trying to um, learn more about RNA structure, function, folding dynamics and everything. Uh, so for the SAM1 riboswitch, um, one of the most basic results in, in many of the riboswitches is that they tend to be very uh, extended and open. And then as you um, titrate in their ligand, then they collapse quite dramatically. And you can see this in a simple um, EMSA assay and also in small angle X-ray scattering uh, here for the SAM1 riboswitch we can see uh, significant compaction as you add in the metabolite uh, shown in light blue and also as you add in magnesium uh, here in a red and also light blue. And, and another theme in RNA for people who aren't RNA people on the call uh, that magnesium is always a key player in almost every RNA system. And the question is always how does magnesium impact function? And, and the fold of the RNA. And so in, our, in a lot of our experimental efforts, um, nowadays we're doing cryo-EM, but in the early days we were pretty much only doing biochemistry and we were using a lot of some of the different chemical probing techniques available. And this is a nice technique that you don't really see in proteins at all. And, and these techniques allow you to basically figure out the mobility of a single residue and you can and you can map out the residues of the whole system one by one and in turn from getting the mobility of that uh, the backbone of that residue people then uh, extrapolate the secondary structure from that information and that the ones that are not very mobile tend to be in Watson Crick pairs and the ones that are highly mobile are not in the Watson Crick pairs they may be in these connecting junction regions or in the loops and so uh, Ron Breaker discovered almost all the riboswitches, switches, um, heavily relying on this technique of inline probing, which is kind of simple. You just make your RNA and you just let it sit and incubate and then it cuts itself. And then you uh, analyze the pattern of, at which it cuts itself and the more mobile backbones um, have higher rates of cleavage. And you're able to map out the mobility of each nucleotide and then the secondary structure. And then in 2005, Kevin Weeks from North Carolina came out with the selective two prime hydroxyl isolation analyzed by primer extension. And this is a similar uh, uh, assay in that it gives almost the same information, but it, you can do it a lot more quickly in only a few hours and it tends to be a little bit more precise. And here you add in a reagent um, in the early days it was 1M7, but now Howard Chang and um, many other folks have developed all kinds of other reagents uh, to use, but the original one, 1M7, it uh, attacks the two prime hydroxyl on the backbone and forms covalent bond only if it's um, highly mobile. And, and so therefore it's a highly reactive, highly mobile nucleotide. 
then you can do uh, reverse transcription and then the uh, polymerase falls off at that, uh, where that um, 1M7 molecule is attached. And then you can sequence, we sequence it on the capillary electrophoresis system. And this way we can map out the activity, the, the mobilities of each nucleotide. And then there are some more um, old school methods like um, DMS probing that probe the face of the bases and also hydroxy radical probing that um, can yield information about tertiary structure. And so uh, we've worked a lot on the SAM1 ribo switch, and this is some of our um, uh, earlier data. And here, um, this is kind of a complicated graph, but what we're trying to show is as you titrate in both SAM and magnesium, how it affects the mobility of the ribo switch. And so in the data on the left, um, you can see, for example, in the, in the upper leftmost graph, uh, this would be looking at one region, the terminal helix P1, and then as you titrate in magnesium, it gets lower, has lower and lower shape reactivity, which means it's less and less mobile. And, and likewise, as you titrate in SAM and so forth. And the overall result that we see is that uh, here uh, in, the, in the cartoon, we're showing the green uh, nucleotides are, I mean, they're ones that are getting more stabilized by either the, the metabolite or the magnesium. And as we add in SAM or as we add in magnesium, it tends to stabilize a lot of the riboswitch, but not the whole thing. And basically we need uh, both SAM and magnesium to get the fully collapsed uh, state for this aptamer. Uh, and, uh, and then we also did an assay uh, this two-piece assay, which is fl uh, fluorescence-based. And here we divided the ribo switch into uh, two halves, the optimer half, and then this uh, other half, which some people call the expression platform. And the idea here is that we mix the two together and then we can see the switching process happen with the fluorescent uh, label. And so we get quenching if the switching goes. And then we can also look at how resistant the aptamer is to this uh, transition. So if it's um, highly uh, stable, then it resists that uh, transition. And so one of our main results was that uh, for uh, the wild type RNA, as we add in ligand, um, we get uh, some quenching, uh, but, and then as we, but without ligand, um, we get rapid quenching. So that means that uh, uh, that with ligand, um, it basically, uh, sorry, it resists this invasion by that second strand, but without ligand, it freely can um, make the transition and hybridize. And then what we did is we looked at different mutants of the system um, to try to see which, which nucleotides were really key in, in uh, preventing this invasion by the other strand. And so we looked at uh, some bases in regions that we thought would be important near the pseudonaut interaction. So in, this, in the SAM riboswitch on the left-hand side, there's this long range base pairing interaction that happens shown in purple, the pseudonaut or PK. And so we did a lot of mutations around there. Uh, these are basically um, related to the tertiary contacts. And we saw a big difference in that when you um, look at some of these mutations, we see a dramatic change in that uh, essentially the second strand can now invade the aptamer even if there's uh, ligand present. And so we see the quenching uh, even with ligand presence. So that means it's allowed the mutants uh, allow the switching to happen when it shouldn't really happen. And so therefore we conclude that those um, nucleotides are really key for um, stabilizing the tertiary contacts in this ribo switch. And we also um, did a lot of more careful uh, titrations, gradually ramping up the SAM. And um, we uh, looked at other mutations and then we also could get the KDs out as well. And then another assay we did was with uh, RNA-H cleavage. Uh, and this enabled us to look more carefully about how this all happens as a function of magnesium 
So here, um, Scott Henley, who is a postdoc in my group at the time, came up with the idea to do this hybrid, hybrid RNA DNA RNA second strand that's susceptible to cleavage by RNA-SH. And then what we could do is we could add the second strand in and then see uh, uh, if this aptamer domain is resistant or not to the strand invasion. And so here uh, we show in the, in the upper panel that as you put in more and more magnesium, uh, you get uh, a, a shift from the cleave to the uh, uncleaved, for example. Um, so what that means is that as you add in more and more magnesium, it's stabilizing the aptamer and preventing the strand invasion. And then we could also look at these magnesium one half values and see that um, SAM modulates the magnesium effect and that there's some cooperativity between the ligand and the magnesium and how they uh, control the switching of this fiber switch. Okay, so those were um, some of the experiments we did. Now I'm gonna talk about some of these native contact uh, models we've been using to simulate fiber switches. Uh, and so this is uh, mostly in collaboration with um, Jose Onuchik at uh, Rice University. And so here in terms of the structure based models, I'm just trying to see that. I can't quite see the title of my slides, but the, uh, in terms of the structure-based models, uh, these are atomistic in detail. Uh, they're uh, knowledge-based, um, and now we have uh, electrostatics in the models, and we do a lot to try to validate these against different uh, experiments. And they allow the breaking and forming of different of uh, contacts and so forth. And this is what one of our um, typical potentials looks like. Uh, this is an all-atom structure-based model. These look like um, similar to a regular MD, although uh, it's uh, essentially the zero points, though, are defined by the native contacts, such as a crystal structure or an all-atom model that you uh, input initially. And so, but they do allow, you know, large-scale conformational changes, uh, breaking of contacts, and so forth. And then in terms of uh, uh, the ions were including uh, explicit uh, magnesium and uh, implicit potassium. Uh, and then we do this with essentially uh, Dubai Huckel potential that includes uh, Manning condensation effects. Uh, you have to excuse me, my, the, there's a plumber here now, so there may be some unusual noises happening <laughs> in the background. Um, so, in terms of the advantages of the structure-based models, um, we can simulate uh, spontaneous large-scale conformational changes. We get a lot of sampling, uh, but one key thing is that it preserves the uh, stereochemistry. And these models were used, as, as most people on the call know, I think, to in the early days of protein folding to try to work out the uh, folding funnel framework. And there you'd start with a disordered uh, protein and just run it, uh, having it undergo thermal fluctuations until you gradually accumulate more and more native contacts finally to get to the full fold. And then you could try to analyze the transitions along the way. And then these, so these are not the same as uh, implicit solvent and they're not harmonically restrained or constrained. These are atomistic in detail. And here we're not really doing much force field development or structure prediction. The idea is that it, in, in a lot of the stuff we do, if you have two sort of A and B states, how does the system get from one state to the other? And what does that look like? And so um, I'll, I'll play the movie on the left first, um, which is one of our simulations of the SAM1 riboswitch folding. And we start this out in a disordered conformation. And then as you run it, more and more uh, native contacts form. And then until eventually you can get uh, the full folded state. And this allows you to look at things like the order of helix formation, uh, how the ligands uh, affect that, and also how magnesium affects that and so forth. And uh, the, the analogy I was drawing here was with this um, skydiving team. This was Skydive Chicago, by the way. And the idea here is that uh, you know, sometimes this movie doesn't play to the end, but I'll let it go to the end. <laughs> Uh, so sometimes, so so the analogy here is that these skydivers are uh, jumping out of this plane, 
And, and as they jump out, initially they make kind of random interactions with different people on the team, but eventually they find their partner. And once they find their partner, they lock arms and that partner, um, that connection sticks. And so then over time, you can get these very complicated um, structures happening uh, from, from accumulating more and more native contacts. Okay, so some of the validation uh, results we had here were on the, uh, we looked at the adenine ribo switch, and these showed good agreement um, with uh, some data from David Draper's group on preferential interaction coefficients, which is sort of a measure on um, how many ions condense onto the RNA, uh, and also for the SAM1 uh, ribo switch as well. And uh, then here, uh, we were looking at the um, uh, fragment of the beet western yellow virus pseudonaut region, and we got um, good agreement here. If you look at the, uh, the solid black curve is the experiment, and then our simulations were the black uh, disks. And then uh, another thing we, we did uh, is to, not, not directly related to our sort of our mechanistic studies, but we uh, put together an algorithm to sort of tune the uh, native contact models to the shape data. And so what we did is we, um, we used a way, we, we came up a way that, to scale the experimental data to, uh, and then use that to scale the uh, contact strengths. And so doing that, we got pretty good agreement um, without SAM and with SAM, this was showing basically a, a number proportional to the reactivity for each nucleotide. And then here, and also you can look at melting curves for every nucleotide or for regions of the ribose switch. And here we are looking at um, comparing experiment and simulation uh, for the one junction on the ribose switch as well. And then you can also um, compare these magnesium one half uh, values as well for uh, the simulation and the experiment. Okay, so, and then, and then finally, there's some more validation results on the SAM2 RIBO switch, where um, here we worked with Kwaku Deus group at Maryland who took SACS data, and we got nice agreement uh, with the SACS data there. And then at the bottom here are some of our energy landscapes that I'll go into more detail in the next few slides. But in a lot of our studies, uh, we try to sort of simulate titrating in magnesium and the ligands. So we do a lot of different uh, magnesium concentrations and different ligand concentrations. In, the, in this particular study, um, we saw that uh, without, uh, without a ligand, we get the, the um, system was exploring kind of this disordered state. And then you, as you add in more and more magnesium, uh, then you, it, it essentially samples uh, the, the balance state, even though there's no ligand there. Okay, so I'll talk more about our energy landscape studies of the RIBA switch now. And uh, one of the main results that we've seen both in experiments and simulations is that the magnesium uh, pre-organizes these uh, partially closed states. So we've sort of divided the different states into an open extended conformation and then the fully folded uh, compact state shown here on the right-hand side. And then we have this partially closed state or PC and then partially open state or PO. And then one of the main results we found here was that uh, when we don't have the ligand in, uh, it's mostly sampling the open or partially open state, but it does sample some of the uh, partially uh, closed state. And then when we add the ligand, we recover the closed state. And then these native contact models allow us to look at the order of helix formation. So in this one, uh, we saw that uh, P1, uh, the terminal helix was forming last, and that uh, second to last was this uh, pseudon pseudonaut interaction uh, forming. And then, and then here we, we saw in, in the simulations that there was kind of a zippering happening between two of the helices, the terminal helix P1 and then the, this uh, P3 helix uh, that helped nucleate the folded state. And these are just showing examples of the different 
conformations in the upper left is the fully open disordered state. And then in the lower right is the fully folded closed state. And then in the upper right is the partially open state. And then the lower left, the partially closed state. And then here we just did some uh, principal component analysis to look at uh, the uh, pseudo knot, uh, to look at fluctuations. And what we saw is that um, fluctuations around the P1 and the pseudo knot were tend to be damped or suppressed by ligand and by uh, magnesium. And then the overall picture we see is, is close to what we saw with our shape probing experiments in that uh, we can get to these partially collapsed states when adding just SAM ligand or just magnesium, but to get to the fully uh, folded state or fully compacted state, we need to have both the ligand and the magnesium. And this was this slide I showed before, but this was showing the same thing with the experiments. Okay, then uh, one of the latest things, I should have updated this, um, this was published a few years ago. Uh, and, and here um, in this study, we were looking at uh, the, in the, in the previous work I was showing you, we were only looking at the aptamer, but here we're looking at both the aptamer and the expression platform. So the full ribose switch, and we're trying to understand the switching process, how it goes from one to the other. Like I showed you those two piece experimental systems where you had the second strand invading the aptamer and we can measure that with fluorescence and with uh, cleavage activity. And so now we're trying to simulate these systems using these native contact models. And so this was the, um, the, the system where the expression platform dominates with that long helix and the aptamer is opened up. And then here's where the aptamer dominates, the ligand is present, and instead you get the terminator uh, helix forming. Okay, and so here we use the dual basin uh, electrostatic all atom structure based model. So the same as before, but with two basins, one for each of those states. And uh, then here uh, we looked at the energy landscapes. And what we saw is that uh, when we, we had a, a way to parameterize basically which, if it's the aptamer state formed, which would be in the lower right or the expression platform state formed, which would be in the upper left. And so um, we could look at the energy landscapes and see what happens as a function of magnesium and of uh, the ligand as well. And so uh, what, what we could see in the upper right here is that when we add in the uh, SAM, then we get the, to the uh, transcription off state or the aptamer state. And then uh, also then in the lower right, when we add in magnesium, we saw some interesting behavior where essentially we kind of saw things go, uh, we, we saw both, uh, both states being stabilized when you add in magnesium. So if you add in uh, magnesium, it can stabilize the aptamer state or the expression platform state, depending on um, how much SAM is there. So um, our main conclusion here was that uh, we think the magnesium is kind of tuning uh, the aptamer. So in, in a sense, without magnesium, uh, this long expression platform helix dominates at moderate magnesium, the aptamer dominates, but then at high magnesium, the expression platform uh, dominates again. So there's kind of this um, sweet spot of uh, magnesium concentration where the, um, the aptamer dominates. Okay, so that was all the ribosome, ribos switch stuff. So now I'm gonna shift to the larger ribosome system and talk to you about a few different confirmations the ribosome makes and how we uh, use simulations to look at those. And I, I should um, say that almost all the visuals here we, we do with VMD. Uh, and, and, and most of the early work we did on ribosomes was with uh, VMD as well. So in terms of the ribosome system, uh, the goal is to understand how tRNAs move through the ribosome. So the ribosome, uh, its function is to read the messenger RNA and make proteins. 
and it's organized in terms of two subunits. You have this 30S small subunit for bacteria, and then the 50S large subunit, and those um, come together around the messenger RNA, and then there's a giant crevice in between them that can fit an entire tRNA, which is about 70 angstroms in length scale, and transport that through the ribosome. And the way it works is that um, once the complex is formed with that cyan colored uh, tRNA bound, uh, then a new tRNA can come in uh, and it binds in this uh, partially bound AT state first. Uh, then it moves to the AA state. The A stands for amino acyl. So the amino acyl tRNA binds in the amino acyl state. And the notation here is that A slash A means it's bound to A site on the 30S and also A site on the 50S. Okay, then you can get a hybrid state forming and then another hybrid state. And then finally, the whole uh, tRNA, mRNA complex can move. This is called translocation. And, uh, and this is a very simple model that Harry Noller put out in the late 80s. But now with all the new cryovium coming out, there's probably maybe 20 intermediates al along this pathway. Okay, and then this was um, some of our original ribosome work that we did using NAMD and VMD. And in this uh, older study, we looked at the movement of the yellow tRNA into the ribosome, and this is called accommodation. And so here we used a simple method called uh, targeted MD, which uh, basically decreases the RMS to the target as a function of time using Lagrange multiplier constraints. And uh, this was nice in that it allowed us to map out the interactions the tRNA makes uh, with especially the large subunit uh, during the process of accommodation. And uh, a lot of uh, several experimental studies have subsequently validated these simulations and, uh, and they've also uh, generated new targets for antibiotics as well. And so here we can see this yellow tRNA come in through this accommodation corridor. And uh, this study, <clears throat> It, it, it enabled us to kind of, um, like you could kind of say that you could see all this just by looking at the beginning and end structures, but it's not so easy with something as complicated as the ribosome. And then another comment to make is that the targeted MD method is quite simple, but because it's such a narrow crevice, there's not too many places that the tRNA can go. It's basically just a way to um, sort of structurally model each, each state and look where the interactions would be in terms of structural modeling. And, um, and so this was this accommodation corridor, uh, Helix 92, and this is almost entirely universally conserved that allows the CCAN to make its final uh, trip to, the, to its destination. And then as you zoom around, um, one of the nice things about this is that uh, it enables you to get the crystal structure when you're finished. I think we made this, I made this movie in 2004. So I think the, the quality has stood the test of time in terms of technology. And so, so we've had um, a few groups validate some of these results. Um, John Dimmon's lab uh, at Maryland and also um, Ronina's group in Germany. Uh, they were able to validate our predicted accommodation gate and some of the residues in the accommodation uh, corridor. And then, uh, okay, this movie is not pointing, sorry. Okay, uh, so I think I'll skip through this. And um, uh, so then uh, I'll show you um, some results we have from these structure-based models or the native contact models. Uh, and we've been using these models to really get at the different um, conformational changes that happen. Uh, so here, uh, we are doing a comparison of sort of four methods. On the left side is this uh, unrestrained all atom goal models or structure-based models or native contact models uh, versus uh, unrestrained uh, explicit solvent. And what the native contact models allow you to do is kind of see what the uh, amount of sampling is required to do really. Um, so it's a way to kind of validate uh, explicit solvent and then uh, 
so in color here are the uh, native contact model, native contact simulations, and then in gray is the explicit solvent. And even with um, close to a microsecond of sampling on the full ribosome, um, we barely sample much of that energy landscape. Uh, and then on the right-hand side, uh, we're looking at um, the targeted MD native contact versus targeted MD explicit solvent. And um, this allows us to kind of uh, have some kind of check on the validity of the native contact force field during transitions. So here, the native contact force field is um, shown in color, and then the explicit solvent is shown uh, with these traces. And then uh, as we um, look at that uh, transition, uh, we were able to make some contact with um, single molecule FRET data. This is data from Scott Blanchard's group, who's now at uh, Tennessee. And, uh, and we could see at least we got the right qualitative uh, effects of the reversible excursions of the tRNA kind of going into and out of the ribosome that they would see in the single molecule FRET. Okay. So now I'll talk about uh, structure-based simulations of ribosomes in terms of uh, translocation of the tRNA through the ribosome. And uh, translocation is a uh, very much more complicated conformational change than accommodation. And so here, uh, there, there are many different sub-steps that happened. Uh, so first, what happens is that you have two tRNAs bound, this red tRNA and the pink tRNA, and then you have a green protein factor, a GTPA CF, EFG, come in, and it uh, partially binds to the ribosome. And then this triggers uh, this famous ratcheting uh, conformational change. Uh, and then at the same time, the pink tRNA moves to this hybrid state. And then as we keep going, uh, we get a second conformational change called uh, head swivel. And in this uh, conformational change, the head region of the 30S uh, rotates. And so here, uh, at the same time, the red tRNA moves to this uh, hybrid state. And then finally, uh, then we can go to uh, the post con con configuration where things basically relax, the head unrotates and the body unratchets. Okay, so let's see if this movie works. Oh, wow, this movie's not working either. Okay, I think I have the wrong slide deck. Uh, yeah, none of the movies are really playing here. Okay, I'll just keep moving along. Okay, so some of the um, analysis uh, we see is that, uh, uh, we can we can repeat our analysis for the accommodation conformational change uh, that we did for the um, hybrid state formation, and so uh, we we were able to identify a new um, hybrid state formation corridor that's almost univers that's universally conserved, uh, similar to the accommodation corridor here that essentially is used to transport the CCA end of the tRNA um, from one state to the next, and then. Also, we were uh, able to look at the energy landscapes again and uh, uh, see uh, how, where the barriers are. And we were able to come up with good uh, order parameters to characterize uh, these transitions. OK, this was an older slide, sorry. <laughs> uh, OK, so that, with that, um, I think I'll wrap up. I'm sorry that some of the movies didn't play. It's been a crazy day today. Um, but I wanted to say that um, we have a new structure-based uh, model that includes electrostatics. Uh, we, um, in terms of the ribose switches, we see that the pre-organized ribose switch state allows for switching, and that the SAM1 ribose switch is tuned to switch at different physiological concentrations for magnesium. And uh, our, we're putting forth this kind of new view of the ribosome of, in terms of a step-wide uh, procession of, through the cycle. Uh, using conformational selection. And I'd like to thank all the people who did the work for the RIBO switches, Scott Henley, Susmita Roy, Ryan Hayes, uh, our collaboration with Jose Onuchik, and for the ribosomes, um, Wataru Nishima, um, Serdal Kermizi-Alton, 
with uh, Paul Whitford and our collaborations with Scott Blanchard and Christian Spahn. And thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Carissa. Very nice, uh, as usual. So now the talk is open for questions. Uh, let me actually start. I've been, throughout my career, I've been scared of nucleic acids because of the counter ions. <laughs> And you know what happens to magnesium. Anytime you're dealing with divalent ions, I, it's kind of scary to think about a stick somewhere and not move. So I wonder what, what the state is now uh, when you include magnesium, for example. You said you're going to place magnesium based on the bihopel and then you let them kind of diffuse. So do you see enough movement of this? And of course, in your uh, mechanisms that you show them, oftentimes magnesium is playing an important role. If you have it or you don't have it, it's going to make a big, big difference. So uh, where are we now in terms of initial magnesium placement and its motion or diffusion during the process? Oh, yeah, this is a great um, question. I was looking for uh, a slide I have about this, but I don't think I'm going to find oh. it. Um, oh, but okay. uh, but we've thought of a lot about this, and um, we've done. A, we have a JAX paper in um, 2012 uh, where we do explicit solvent on the ribo switch, and mm -hmm. um, that helped us hone our uh, protocols, I'd say. And so, in terms of our protocols, um, what what Eric Westhoff really showed in the uh, early 2000s was that um, it's not just having counter ions is not not very good, basically. And the reason for that is if you um, populate counter ions around your RNA and one flies off, then it never comes back usually. And then that, mm -hmm. that can cause distortions in the, in the backbone or wherever it is. Mm -hmm. um, so we make sure we have a um, full box of ions and we try to get that close to physiological concentration. Um, so, and then in terms of the ribosome, uh, it, it is pretty hard to get a ribosome run uh, working. Uh, so, and a lot of that, in my opinion, hinges on the ions. And so yeah. uh, what yeah. we basically do is we freeze the whole ribosome and then we scramble the ions as best we can. Um, I like to do it by putting the ions with a big radius and not having water, but you could just run it high. There are a lot of ways to do that. Um, I see. So we scramble the ions as much as we can. And then, uh, then what I like to do is slowly release the system so that I have the frozen ribosome and then mm -hmm. also maybe frozen magnesiums after they're scrambled and then let the water go, then let the potassium go, then the magnesiums and then slowly let the RNA go and then let it fly like that. I see, um, I see, I see, I see. But do you think actually you see enough, let's say magnesium on binding? So let's say- Okay, uh, yeah, I think that... so we have a grant yeah. on this. And uh, uh, so um, in, in that JAX paper, we see three yeah. populations of the magnesiums. Um, one is the diffuse background. The, the other one, which is what everyone knows, the chelated ones that are stuck. And then we right. see a third population that jump around inside. Oh, okay, uh, these are these outer sphere uh, magnesium. And um, so we find that within like 10 microseconds, you have enough to sample that mid intermediate population, but not enough for the bound magnesiums. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. So we're working with the goal models now, we're working on models to kind of simulate water exchange in the term or magnesium binding unbinding you know, oh, just to I mimic see. it um I but, see, I see. but yeah. um for explicit solvent there's a few groups out there like um um Al alessandra v villa in um in stockholm uh and mm -hmm. there's one or two others um dave case is working a lot on this as well mm -hmm. um ca coming up with better uh magnesium force fields and explicit solvent sure. um, i nice. think we're getting close like I would say you need maybe 10 milliseconds to uh, mm -hmm. sample it, 10 to 100 milliseconds. So we're getting mm -hmm. close. I think pretty soon we'll, we'll be there to just sample it, you know, but for the time millisecond, being. Millisecond, millisecond or microsecond? Milli, 10 millisecond, I'd say. Yeah, 10 milliseconds. Okay, I see, I see, I see. Is what you need. Wow. Um, but, the, but people are coming up with a few tricks nowadays to do it with microseconds. I see, so, yeah. I, see I see. Oh, gotcha, gotcha, gotcha. Very, very interesting. So actually, uh, uh, I have a second question, but let me first see if there are other questions among the audience. Uh, 
if you have a question, you can physically raise your hand or yeah. Zoom raise your hand or uh, or just start talking. Actually, you, you can. So then the, this is actually probably a general question for all of these Go kind of type models. Do you, can you, I, I guess in principle, you can get frustrated at a particular misfolded, let's say, yeah. state yeah. during this transition. So is, is, is that very common, frequent, or you have to deal with it? Uh, or, that, this is a great question in that um, we actually want to see more frustration because they are designed to have zero frustration, pretty much this smooth funnel. Uh, so we have a little oh. bit of, of um, non-native contacts in there now with electrostatics, but in, R in the RNA world, folding is totally different than proteins in that it, it gets trapped a lot more. And to be mm -hmm. realistic, it, it should get trapped. So we're trying to put in um, more and more non-native effects to get the landscape looking more like reality now. Um, if you don't want frustration, they're great because it goes right through. You know? yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, okay, I see, I see. Very interesting, very interesting. Okay, thank you. So any other questions, students? I have a question. Um, Go ahead. So these riboswitches and their interactions with the magnesium are really interesting. Do you, can you comment on uh, your thoughts on uh, their role in evolution? Um, uh, so I know pre-protein ribozymes were, were the ruling enzymes. So I'm curious if Ibo switches had. Or do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, absolutely. It's a great question, and and the whole reason I got into ribosomes in in the beginning was about evolution, and um, looking trying to find the the last molecular artifact to work on basically, and so I, I do think that well Ibo switches themselves um, they're only in bacteria they're not in humans you know so they're only in mostly bacteria and plants but um, mm -hmm. but to, but the reason I'm in, I we do a lot on non-coding RNA, and I believe that it it might give clues into what was going on in the RNA world. You know that that's why one of the main reasons I I work in non-coding RNAs, because um, you know apparently uh, presumably there was an RNA world originally, and mm -hmm. you know it formed these RNA replicators, and then and then maybe those were optimized, and you had. Uh, you know, more and more different kinds of RNA structures evolving to um, try to improve that optimization, optimization, and then you'd get regulation and all kinds of stuff, you know, so, and I think this all comes down to RNA structure function, and it's, mm. and, it, and also it's a lot, it's kind of, in my opinion, it's a little more direct to get at what happened in the early days, and also it's easier too, because you have secondary structure, as well as tertiary structure, and you can predict a lot just with the 2D yeah. Watson Creek base pairing and so forth. But. So, are people trying to do an alpha fold for RNA structure also? Do you, uh, are you aware of certain? Uh -huh. Yeah, I mean, Riju Das is uh, blazing forward. Um, so, I'm sure he's already working on it with Google now, uh -huh. is my guess. You know? but, uh, okay, we uh, stay tuned. <laughs> yeah, they, the main thing is we don't have a lot of data in the PDB. Yeah. You know, there's hardly any compared to proteins. So oh, I see. I see. I see. I see. that I makes see. it a lot harder. Yeah. Sure, sure, I see. Okay, good. If there are no more questions, I thank Carissa one more time for joining us for the seminar. So everybody else, thank you for joining. So you can leave. So people who are meeting with Carissa, I think it's- Thank you for organizing. Uh, good to see you, Carissa. Okay, okay. thanks, sir.